Today's class is offered to the general public by the BYU Family History Library. Questions related specifically to the family history work of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints should be addressed on an individual basis with one of our missionaries, either in person or virtually. Our presenter today is Franklin West, who has a love of learning and an extensive background in family history and genealogical research. We hope you will find your time with us productive and enjoyable. I'll now turn the time over to Elder West. Elder West, okay, here you go. Thank you. Let me share my screen. Okay. See. All right, that should be it. Now, the agenda that we started, we started last week uh, with points one and two, the importance of Chinese characters, is when you're doing Chinese genealogy, uh, the main inputs have to be done in Chinese characters because those are the only things that don't change. The English renditions of what the characters are are uh, myriad. And so you always have to do that with the characters. And I gave you some ideas for how to be able to do that. Second thing, second point made here is what information do you need to know in order to get started in your Chinese research? The assumption is that you already know something about how to do things in family search. Uh, so what I'm going to address are the things that you have to do differently uh, or singularly uh, in doing Chinese genealogy. The first thing we talked about last week is you need to know your ancestor's name in Chinese characters or his Xing name. Uh, the second thing which we covered briefly was your ancestor's ancestral home. Uh, now, one of the comments from last week said, shouldn't we have something that tells us where these places are? And uh, so I've added significantly to the presentation because it makes a really big difference <clears throat> where your ancestor is from and where you should do the research. Uh, the last two things we're going to cover today is how to find your japu, which is your, and your genealogy, uh, which sometimes is not that easy. And the fourth thing we're going to do is to illustrate how to input Chinese names and other information into family search, where you'll have to use the characters to do some of the, the most important parts of this. So <clears throat> what we said last week is you need to know where your ancestors are from. Now, this is a picture of China. That's a pretty big place. I think it's almost the same size as the United States. I've been in China, and the distances are fairly significant. So it's very difficult to figure out where they are, but it turns out it's very, very simple because almost everybody that came to the United States came from just one or two areas. So we're gonna talk about <clears throat> what, that, what those are. Now, I got interested in, in the geography of China back when I was called on a mission in 1967 uh, to Hong Kong. And I was on a two and a half year mission there. I found out while I was out there that my great, great grandfather, Chauncey Walker West, had been with a number of missionaries who went to Asia on missions. They were called on missions to Asia in 1853. He spent about a year to a year and a half just getting there and getting back. So he actually did missionary work for probably about uh, one and a half years or so. Uh, but he was called to, uh, to uh, um, Taigo, I'm trying to think of it in, in Chinese, uh, Thailand. Uh, and it was very difficult for him to get there, and he wasn't able to do it because there was a war going on. But he did stop in Hong Kong for about three weeks, and he was also there during the Taiping Rebellion, which was a huge war internally within China. Uh, and so he had to get out quickly one day. He had to go fairly well. But it was very interesting to see uh, that he was there. He eventually got to Kolkata in India uh, and then went over to Mumbai. So we have a long history in my family of roots in sort of the Asia Pacific area. Now, <clears throat> you need to know that in Guangdong, the Chinese population from the mid 1800s until the 1950s, Guangdong Siyi region accounted for the vast majority of immigrant Chinese, about 80%. So if you're gonna look for your ancestors, uh, you're probably gonna look at a subset of the Guangdong province. The rest of China was not really open. Uh, 
uh, in Guangdong province were primarily interested in just one, prefe uh, one uh, uh, prefecture, which is Jiangmen. And you can see where that is uh, right here. Uh, within Jiangmen province, there are six or four counties and they're called the Siyi, S-I-Y-I, or in Chinese or in uh, Cantonese, they're called Si. Yep. Uh, and that is right sort of in the center of Guangdong province. To show where they are right here, you can see there's Kaiping, Xinhua, Taishan, and Enping. Those are the primary places. Periodically, you get some from Zhongshan, or I've seen some from Panyu, but they're all from around this area. Now, these people, because <laughs> they spoke the Cantonese language, uh, were known as the Taishanhua. It was a variation on Cantonese or Toisanwa in Cantonese. Now the importance of these people, which is, you know, it's probably only about 50 or 60 miles square uh, that all these people lived in. Uh, every Chinese American community here in the United States was dominated by the language, cuisine, and culture of these Taishan Cantonese people. So for instance, in New York, if you go to Chinatown, uh, I was very interested to see when I got back there in 1972 that uh, everybody spoke my language. They were all speaking Cantonese, which of course is what you speak in Hong Kong. Uh, as the years wore on, I was there for about 30 or 40 years, uh, it more and more turned into various different dialects and more and more towards Mandarin, which is of course the standard language for everyone to speak in China. Uh, but if you go to London's Chinatown, I went there and they spoke uh, Cantonese. Very interesting. When you speak Cantonese, there's never an accent. Uh, whereas when you speak Mandarin, there's almost always some sort of an accent because it, it varies by each individual location. But because Cantonese came from this very narrow area, it's always stayed the same. And it's the same everywhere in most of these Chinatowns. Now, therefore, if you are looking for your ancestors, there's no need to go to Anhui or to Shanxi or any place else uh, because 80 or 90% of the people came from these uh, and this Zhang, Zhangmen district to map and primarily from those four areas. A lot of them also came from Hushan up at the top. Now in Pinyin, these are called the Siyi, but very often when people write it as a romanization, they'll call it the Seyup or Siyup or something like that because that's how you'd say it in Cantonese. But it's these four cities, or these four uh, counties. There's Xinhui, Xin which is pronounced Sunhui in Cantonese, Taishan in Mandarin, and Toisan in Cantonese, Kaiping or Hoiping, and Enping or Yanping. And then those are the characters for them right there. So if you can find your Japu, it's probably going to be somewhere in one of these areas. Uh, most of the research that I've been doing has been in Taishan. So I think probably the vast majority of the people came actually from the Taishan area. This is on the west side of the Pearl River in the southern Guangdong province. Now this name, Si Yi, gets misused a lot. I've seen this happen. So you can see on this uh, family group record here, there's somebody whose name is Shi, and in parentheses it says Si Up. Now, si up is another way of saying Si Yi. So everybody knew that that name was in there. They thought it was her name. It's not her name. It's where she's from. She's from those four areas. I've seen that happen in a lot of people's genealogy. So whenever you see Si Yi or Si Yup uh, show up, you need to know that that's a location. It's not a name. Now, the Si, si Yi also are very near to Hong Kong and to Macau. Hong Kong's on one side of the Pearl River and Macau over here is on the other. And Jiangmen right over here, which is where the Siyi are, are in this particular area. Now the distance from Hong Kong to the sort of the center of Jiangmen to Taishan is only about hundred miles. Uh, so most of the people that immigrated to the United States, they came over to either Hong Kong or Macau, and that's where they got passage over to the United States. Now, why is it and that the Siyi area is where all of these people came from. Uh, for many years, China said, we don't want to trade with anybody outside of China 
at any other place than Guangdong and uh, specifically Guangzhou. Uh, and even after the British came along and during the Opium War and opened up Hong Kong, it was still just Hong Kong, Guangzhou, almost all of the trade was done, uh, was done through that area. So if you were going to go someplace outside of China, you'd undoubtedly go either to Guangdong or more probably to Hong Kong or Macau. So because these people lived in close proximity to the only port in China, that's how they got out. Now, more recently, in the last 30 or 40 years, there's been more people integrating from a place called Fujian, which is the northernmost county. So if you go here down to Guangdong, and the next county up is, or the next uh, uh, prefecture up is, is uh, Fujian. The two main cities in Fujian are Xiamen, up here at the top, or it used to be called Amoy, and Fuzhou. So that's one of the places where things have happened in the last 30 years. So they passed a law back in the 1890s, which forbid anybody to come from China. And so it cut off all the people coming from Guangdong. And it's only after World War II that that opened up again. And that's where a lot of these people came from. Now, <clears throat> We also had people immigrating from Taiwan. This also was later. So the Taiwanese migration to the United States did not begin until after World War II. Uh, since then, a lot of people have come over from Taiwan. And the main reason is <clears throat> they very often wanted to get educated or they were highly educated. Uh, and so there was not the uneducated farmers from before, it's people who came because of the business opportunities uh, that were there. Um, a good, interesting thing about this in Westchester County, uh, IBM has a research center there, which is called the Thomas Watson Research Center in Kichwan, New York. Uh, when I was there, they had almost the entire people that were there were all from Taiwan. Uh, they're all people that had their doctorates in various different sciences. Uh, it's because they were doing fundamental research there. So I got very interested because at that time I knew that Cantonese was only spoke, spoken in, in Chinatowns and in, uh, in Hong Kong. So I wanted to start studying Mandarin. So I asked them if I could go to their Mandarin classes on Saturday morning because they wanted to make sure that their, people, their children uh, knew the language and the culture. So for six years, I uh, went uh, with them to school and it helped me to learn my Mandarin much better. It was, uh, it was a lot of fun to be able to do that. Now, the number of immigrants from China residing in the United States nearly doubled from 1980 to 1990, and again by 2000. Uh, so we've got quite a few people, there are about two and a half million uh, Chinese people from Chinese descent uh, in the United States now. So it's uh, a lot of people. And the immigration has changed. So we saw that originally for, from 1850 to about 1950, uh, there were people that were coming primarily from the Sigi area near Guangdong. Uh, and they were primarily coming over for the gold rush. And then later they helped to do the transcontinental railroad. Uh, since World War uh, II, and we had a lot more from Taiwan and from Fujian. So if you're looking for ancestors, you need to know which one of those areas were they probably from. So the more recent immigration demographics, they Hong Kong born immigrants make up about 10% of all Chinese graph uh, immigrants residing in the United States. The United States is the top destination for Chinese immigrants. So we still have a lot of people immigrating from there. Uh, and in the United States, they reside primarily in two states, California uh, and New York. Now, once you have the Chinese characters for your ancestors name, and the name of their small ancestral village. So you've gone now and found out where in Taishan and wherever it is uh, that they're from, and you know what their name is with the Chinese characters. So the name of the city and the name of that. Then if you have a Japu, you can go and see where they fit in. For instance, on this one over here, I happen to know that for this family, this is the Kwang family. Whoops. This is the Kwang family. They were from a little town called Chao Si in uh, Taishan. Uh, so that's a good indication. And that city never had more than about 60 people in it. 
So if you can find people that are from that area, more than likely you would find them in this Japu because this Japu centers itself on just the Kwangs that lived there for about seven or 800 years. Now, the problem is once you found your ancestor's name and the name of the place they're from, uh, you still may not have the Japu and that's a problem. So question is, that third point is, how do you find your Japu? So Japu, once again, is your genealogy. And ja means family and Pu means record. So it's your family record. Unfortunately, in the mid 1960s, there was something called the Cultural Revolution, which went on for about eight years. Uh, and at that time, Mao got everybody kind of stirred up and uh, wanted to uh, sort of have China be a little bit more fundamental. And so he called on all the students uh, to go out and take the, his phrases that he had in his little red book. And they did a lot of destruction of things that were related to the religion in China. In China, keeping your genealogy is part of the Confucian religion. And so you're supposed to do it. And they destroyed a lot of the ancestral temples and the places where they had this. Uh, I was actually there in Hong Kong when this happened. We had to stay inside for almost a month. They sent off about half of all the missionaries in, in, in the uh, Hong Kong area. Uh, and they were about ready to send all the rest of us off as well. So I was one of the 40 missionaries that was allowed to stay. But I remember looking out the window during those three weeks and they, they these uh, red guards sort of marching up and down the streets. But <clears throat> there are a lot that are still there. So a lot of them were destroyed. You still need to try to see if you can get it. Now, the way you can find these, uh, the church has gone and, and copied a lot of these records, these Japu. They haven't indexed them, so you can't search on a name. You have to search by location and by last name. Uh, so once we've done that, which is two things that we needed to know before. Uh, there are other collections which can be searched, but primarily, whenever you see anybody talking about uh, searching Chinese records, they're talking about family search using it. And the way you get there, it's actually a little bit complicated in family search. So you just go through and you click on all these, there are about five or six clicks here. Uh, you get a copy of this. And we're going to post this on the website afterwards. So you'll be able to get it. Uh, but this is how you would get there. So first you go to the search function at the top. Uh, that brings up a number of things. You go down to the bottom to the research wiki. Then over at the very far left, over here, online genealogical records, which is what we're looking for. You click on that. Uh, we want Asia online genealogy records. Uh, then we want the Chinese online genealogy records from the Asia ones. Down here, we want compiled genealogies. You notice the dates here. They start back. If you if you get a Japu, they very frequently will go back seven or eight hundred years. So once you're there, you get a lot more <laughs> than you get any place else if you weren't doing Chinese genealogy. And then finally, you get Chinese collection of genealogies. Now these are not indexed. So if you want to do it, you have to browse through all 13 million images. Now, fortunately, they have divided them into names. So that brings it down so you don't have to search nearly so many. So by the time you click on that, uh, my friend that I'm working with, his last name is Kwong. And so you go down here and you can see there are two Kwongs. So you have to know which Kwong it is, which character, or actually three Kwongs, looks like. I happen to know that it's this character right here. So we click on that. And then hey, you're going to get a, a number of records that are available at that location. So I'm starting in Taishan because I know that's where they're from. And we know that that's part of the Siyi. Uh, so there I went and found one. This is what the name of it is right here in Chinese. It's done in 1986. They had to reconstitute it after the Red Guards had destroyed it. So a lot of them had, had saved them somewhere and reconstituted it. And here you can see this is Kuang Shi Japu. So this is the Kuang family's genealogy. Now there will very often be multiple ones. So you need to look and see. You probably have to look through all of them. This particular one has 16 pages. So it won't be as difficult to search through as some other ones. Now, if you can't find it in family search, and if you can't find it in family search, uh, you're, you're down almost two strikes uh, because it's a little bit difficult to find it after that. 
uh, first thing you do is you check with all living relatives because the first son is supposed to keep the record up to date. Now that's a, a responsibility which I'm not sure is still being kept up, but originally that was what was supposed to happen. So very often you can find, you know, some of your older people who will know where some of these records are. And I've, I've found that's been a very good place to search. Uh, the Shanghai Library has the, the largest number of Japus, uh, but I find it very difficult to get in there and access it. You almost have to go to Shanghai. But apparently you can go there on the reading floor and you should be able to find things. So if you can't find them someplace else, I want to go to an interesting big city, uh, then the Shanghai Library has a lot. And the other one, which is very interesting, and, and it's actually been fruitful in a number of cases, is visit your ancestral village's temple or shrine in China to see if they have an extant copy. So this is ex an example of a shrine. Uh, they have it there and very often inside, even against the wall, they will have who all the ancestors are in sort of a tree shape. Uh, some of them have been restored. If you go to uh, Hong Kong, uh, there's a very famous temple called Wang Dai Sin. Uh, when I was there, it was in a very bad section of town, and which is of course where we all attracted because you only attract bad, bad areas. Uh, and it wasn't very good shape. Uh, since then, I've gone back and they totally renovated the area. They've torn down all the resettlement areas that were there and they've replaced it with this very beautiful temple. And so you may find that people have taken ones that have been destroyed, have reconstructed them or redone them, and therefore they may have some of that information there. Final way you can find records is just to have things happen that you hadn't expected to happen. Uh, one of the fellows that I'm working with, whose name, last name is Kwong, that I've been using to illustrate this, uh, nobody knew where his book was, but he had an uncle who was on a mission, with a fellow whose name was Sam Tang. Well, Sam Tang knew that uh, he was looking for Kwong genealogies, and one time when Sam was in Hong Kong, he went into a bookstore, and he found there are two copies of Kwong genealogies, just, I mean, just serendipitously. Uh, so he called uh, Kenneth, who was uh, my friend's uncle, and said, we'd like to have these. So he has sent those over to us. And now we have, it's about 500 and some odd pages long. It's a huge number of people. And uh, that has been the most valuable thing that we've done. So a lot of times you have to be in the process of searching, but the way you actually get the records is sometimes a little interesting. Uh, you can easily tell in this case that uh, there are a lot of people up in heaven who are interested in having that found and having it recorded. So you get them interested and they'll help you out. Now, once you have a name and the Japu, so you know what the Chinese name is and you've got the Japu and you know what the location is, how do you find your ancestor in it? Because you're going to have to look through all the images uh, and that's a quite a time consuming task. Well, the first thing you do up at the top here is you find the generation number, usually from the middle name that will be the same. I'll show you how that works in just a minute. Uh, but for each generation, there's a poem that every Chinese family has that indicates what the middle name will be for that, all of the men and for the women. Uh, they will also <clears throat> uh, let you know what the generation is from the very first ancestor who moved there. So, in this case, there's an ancestor who moved uh, to Taishan back in the 1100s. We have his birth date. Uh, and then you can count the generations down. And this person's uh, grandfather was in the 27th generation. So I'll show you how that works. Uh, there are very few index names, so you can't do that. But as we put more and more of these in, you'll be able to search them. So all the ones that we put in, you can actually search now. Now, uh, this friend of mine's grandfather's name is Kuang Xian Jing. Uh, now we know that because he had a name of Jing, which turns out to be this character right here, you'll see that everybody in that generation should have something that's either Jing or close to it. This is a Jung character, which is very close to it. Here's a Jing character. All of these are Jing characters over here. Uh, so that's one thing you do, you find out which generation has that middle name. Uh, so we know that's the case. So that's, that's the first thing uh, you need to do. And then <clears throat> you try to find out how he was related. 
Now, th in this book, there was a space left here for someone who was not recorded. But because, because we know that Xian Jing, the Jing character is here, uh, we have that a um, gravestone that has this person's name on it. And it came from this very small village, which is this Chaozi village up here. So there's about, <clears throat> there's a lot of circumstantial evidence that his grandfather was right here where they left his face. And we're probably about 95% correct that he's here. Once he's here, then you start putting in all of these other people. Uh, you notice that they, they don't have uh, three, three names. Usually you'd have a last name and two first names. In this case, because the entire family is Kwong, they just assume that's the last name. So these are all first names and they're almost always two characters uh, that go with it. Now, once you've found your ancestor in family or in uh, the Japu, you have to record it in family search. So how does a person's record get put into family search accurately? And I'm just going to use my Chinese name as an example uh, because I don't I don't want to add or change anybody else's, but I can I can take it right up to the point where I uh, can stop. So this is the ancestor that we're talking about that my friend. Uh, that we're going to use me as an example. So you begin by going up to the top of your screen. And so the overview tree, person, and recents. These are recent people that you've accessed. Uh, but down at the bottom, it has something called add unconnected person. So you click on that. Uh, and then it's always in English. It shows up in English. So you're going to put in somebody. So I'd put in here Franklin West the third, right? Uh, but we don't want to put it in, in English. We want it in Chinese because the Chinese characters are the only thing that don't change. Uh, so what you do is you click on this right here, and then there'll be a drop-down menu where it will let you choose Chinese. Okay. If you click on the Chinese, then it, instead of English, Chinese shows up, and you get two new lines. There's a line here, Hansa. That's what the language is called um, in Mandarin, in uh, in uh, Mandarin language, it's called Hansa because they're the Han people and so that means name. Uh, and then there's the Roman name down here. I would think you'd put in the Romanized name first or the sort of English version of it. Uh, but actually, <clears throat> uh, you start up here with the characters. So the very first thing you do, my last name is Wei. So you take this name right here, you put the character in using your Chinese keyboard that I showed you how to do last week or indicated how you could get it to work. So you can actually type in the character. And then if you come down and click and last name's down here, it will put it into Pinyin, which is the, uh, the romanization that is going to be constant and has been accepted by uh, China. Then you do the same thing with my first and last name, the first name. I put in the on character, it translates it down here. And then I put in the da character. Second, it translates it down here. So there's my name, last name first, Wei. My first name, on the. Uh, so that's why we have to have the characters and why you have to understand enough about characters to be able to come up with the names. I spent quite a bit of time on that last week. Now, there are a whole bunch of issues here with names that uh, tend to obfuscate a bunch of things. First thing is that most Chinese men, his, men historically have more than one name. Uh, so upon maturity, it was common for an educated male to require a courtesy name, which is a zi name. Uh, they could also choose pseudonyms or aliases, which is the hao name, or pen names. I haven't seen many pen names, but I've seen a lot of zi names and a lot of hao names. And periodically, there's a taboo name that you can use that I don't understand at all because you're not supposed to use it. Uh, but that very often shows up and that's called a hui. So you're going to have to record all of these names. Usually the zi name is the one that was used in maturity uh, and that's the one that you want to record. So if you look here, this is the person's name. His so last name is uh, Al. And then down here it says where he's from, Guangdong Pan Yi. But down here at the very bottom, you'll see there's a zi, and his zi name are these two characters here. Those are probably the ones we would put in in family search. 
So you have to know that about these names. You have to make sure you know which name it is. For instance, here's a genealogy we have where it has a Zua name and a Hui name. Uh, this is the Zua name right here. So it says this is the uh, 21st generation. There's two, 10, one, 21st generation. The Zua name was this. The Hui name was this. So he actually had two names. This is one that he would not have used, uh, but would have. This is probably the one that, whoops, probably the one he was known as. Fast with my fingers. And then by the side here, it gives what his wife's last name was. This is his last name. And she came, said that she came from this family. And down here to say that they had three sons and they had surnames and Hui names. Well, no, I had one son. That it's the name of this and the name of this. So you have to look for those characters. There are only two or three of them, but they'll always list them. So you should be able to see it. Now, recording alternate names, we've got, in this case, we've got my friend's uh, grandfather's name, Huang Xian Jing. But you can also, You can also record alternate names. And he was known by about five or six different names. He was known by Hing Siap. You know, there's that Siap or Si Yu name again. And that shouldn't be in there, but some people thought that was it. Hun Ken Mai Tin Fong. His last name, he called his name Fong, even though his last name was Kwong. Uh, go down here, this is the name that he actually, that's the accurate name. And then he was known by Kwong King. Uh, so you record all of those things. Some of them have to you know, try to make sense of it after a period of time, but usually the Zua name is the one that it lists up at the front. But make sure you record all of the other names down here under alternate names too. Very often when you're doing side research, then you're going to need to know what they were called. Uh, you then record the birth date and birthplace to the best of your knowledge. Now these will have to be estimated because nobody ever lists where they were born. They're in a Japu from a certain area. So you just assume that they were born there. But there's no one, no place ever where it says that. And usually they'll only give the birth date of the original ancestor. And you'll have to figure out 27 generations later about what that would be. Uh, in order to actually input it into family search, you need to know at least a place and a date. But you notice what I've got down here, it is about 1821. And I said at or near Chongyun by Sha Kai Shan uh, So that gives an indication to people that you're not sure, but this is your best indication of where it's going to be. Once you get all this information put in, you've got my name here, Wei Anda, you've got the birth date, you've got the birthplace. Uh, family Search goes out to see if there's another person that has that name. Make sure that you haven't already put it in. And if you haven't, then you can click create person and that's how you get. So all this you know, getting all the uh, names in Chinese characters, the places in Chinese characters doing all of this, the end of it is to create a person and has it here. Now, <clears throat> here's another person named Kwong Shunda. Uh, and when you put all of this in, the way it's gonna show up is under details. The details and vitals and you notice that the name, the very first name is actually Chinese characters. Uh, and then this is going to be the romanization in Pinyin. Uh, we've got the, and here's a male, doing what his birth date is, and death date down here. Now, how do you get estimates for places and dates? You have to estimate the birthday. It's estimated by sure die, which is the generation. And common generation in all merits of that generation. The date will usually have to be computed starting from the birth date of the first ancestor, which is usually called a Shurzu, right here, which is usually the only date given. So in this particular case, there's a there's one Shurzu was born in 1104. Uh, then you have to take 1104, subtract it off from uh, the last ancestor and when you know when they died or when they were born. And then you have to divide that by how many uh, generations you have. So in this case, it's 27 generations. So you're only going to come up with an estimate of the birth date. 
And if it's accurate within 10 or 20 years, that's probably as good as you're going to get. In the first place, you just have to assume that it's wherever the job is for, you assume they're from that, even though we know that they're probably in, in the vicinity. But very few people moved back then. Uh, they'd be in the same place for hundreds of years. So you probably get that one right. We'll probably not know the death data place or the marriage data place. I've seen once in a while marriage. I don't think I've ever seen death or uh, marriage dates unless they were on a, a um, gravestone, which you saw last week. Now, wives are a very sticky problem. As we mentioned before, you're seldom given the wives' names. Uh, so you don't know what her name is or where she came from. However, if on every one of these, if a man has children, it implies that he had a wife. So there is a person there, and we need to have that person receive their uh, work and, and have <laughs> uh, be entered into their uh, kind of search account. So there's one way to record this, and this is just my way of doing it. So I, I don't know if this is the official way or not, but a Chinese person would not mistake it if it were done this way. In the title space, which is the very first thing in, in, line, in the line on the name, uh, you would input Fu Ren, which are these two characters right here. And that means wife. And then you put in the first and last name of whoever the wife's husband was. So you say Fu Ren, Kuang Xian Jing. So this is the husband's name, and she will be called Fu Ren, which just says basically Mrs. Kuang, uh, Kuang Xian Jing. You usually estimate her birthday is three or five years after her husband. Um, most often, men. Uh, didn't marry until they were later in life, and they usually picked a younger wife. So anywhere up to around 10 or 15 years is uh, common. And then you assume that she was born in the vicinity of the husband's ancestral village, which is probably not a good assumption, because most of them, you have to go and get somebody. They had married uh, matchmakers to get them from other families. Uh, but you don't have any idea where they are, so you have to do that. And that at least sort of ties it to a location that's pretty close. So the way this would look as you're putting things in, but once again, we're doing Chinese, we go to Hans, then we put in Fu Ren, and then my last, if this were my wife, Fu Ren, Wei, Han De, and uh, then it would come up here in Mandarin as well. Now, once again, I, like I said, I don't know if that's the right way to do it, but it is very clear to anybody that's Chinese uh, what that means. Now, the next thing we do, so we've entered in all the key things that we need to know. We've got the date, uh, the birth date. Uh, we don't have the marriage date, but we do have, birth, uh, sometimes we have the death date. Uh, but one of the things you need to do is once you put all this information in, you need to tell people, how do you know it was true? Well, you take the job and you, one way to do it, which I've done, is to take a picture of your cell phone you need, using the memories app and it will then record it in your gallery. Uh, you give it a title in gallery, and then you create a source using a photograph JPEG file in your gallery. I'm not going to go through how to do that in detail, but it's not particularly difficult. Uh, and there are easy ways to get someone to help you do that. And then you save it to your source box at the same time in case you want to use it for someone else. So it's very important. Very few people seem to put down the sources for the documents that they have. And uh, it's very important to do it because even we don't know if this is right or not. Somebody may come along and find out that what we did is totally incorrect, but they need to see what source we have for why this is correct. Now, the other thing you need to do, if you can, is put in other memories if you have them. If you have any photographs of any of your ancestors, you need to get those in very quickly. I found that when people look at uh, family search, the main thing that they want to look at is pictures. If there are pictures there, they'll look at it. Uh, if there are documents, they won't be nearly as interesting. So if you can find any pictures, that's really a, a key thing. Uh, then you also put in documents, uh, translation of very famous of various events. For instance, in many job groups, they'll have famous ancestors and they'll talk about them. Uh, they'll have uh, a fair amount of information about the first ancestor in the ancestral village where it came from and why. Very important to know where they originally came from. Most of them came from in the center of China somewhere. 
Uh, they very often have the location of the ancestral village, usually very small. And they will sometimes have a map of where the graves are for various ancestors uh, and pictures of them. It's very interesting. So you get a lot more information uh, than just the genealogy and you need to document that as best you can. And then they'll also have some stories about, especially famous people, about how they got there or how they saved the world, things like that. So <laughs> last words are, you never have all the information you really want. As you can see, as I was going through here, a lot of this was indicative information. Uh, but if you can at least get a good estimate of the birth date and the birthplace, uh, and part, part of the name can be implied if you know the generation name, there, there are things that you can do. And then there are places in family search where you can say uh, why you did it, and you can indicate how certain you are that this is accurate or not. So the next steps for you are you need to go out and try to use what I've got here. It's a four-step process uh, that tells you how to go about doing it. it. It's not that easy, but it's not that hard. Uh, but do what you can to get started following the method I've outlined until you run into some blockage. And at some point you will, for sure, I can guarantee, you probably need to have some help from either BYU Family History Library missionaries like myself, or the Church Family History Library missionaries in Salt Lake City. Uh, both of them will provide cons you know, online consultations. And you can do it, you know, if you just have a simple question, you can do that if you have more complicated. Uh, we'd be very happy to help, but you, you'll probably find that you'll need to get some help. So don't wait around. As soon as you run into a problem, just give us a call. Now, in order to do that, how do you contact the libraries for help? Uh, well, for the BYU Family History Library, they have on, the, on their webpage, there's virtual family history help. Uh, so there you can go and if you click on that, you can to join a missionary, whoops, to join a missionary virtual desk. Uh, and then you'll be able to get some. So it's very easy to do it. You don't have to know any phone numbers or anything. All you need to do is you know, be able to use Zoom, which we're all pretty familiar with now. Uh, up at the Salt Lake Library, they have uh, research help here. And uh, so you can, you can get them to help you as well. Final thing is there are a couple of useful websites. Uh, and these are clickable. And once again, we'll have it in, in uh, <clears throat> along with uh, the recording. Uh, but in Family Hist Search, they have a Chinese language helps for job food too. It's a PDF in Family Search. That is very useful because it talks about a lot of the things I've talked about here in, in even more detail. And then there's a one called Chinese Websites and Family Search, which are sort of hit or miss, but if you're having a hard time getting uh, to something, then there are at least other places you can go and you can kind of go to one and goes to another and you can probably eventually get where you want to go. The other sources, probably the best one is um, the National Library of China, which is in uh, Shanghai, I think. Uh, but there are other places also that have a lot of these. So if you're having difficulty, then you can go to these others. Uh, the likelihood of finding things there is probably not that great unless you really know what you're looking for. And then I've just listed some information about the Shanghai Library here. I, uh, that for sure is a place if, you're, if you come to a blockage and have the money and time, it's worth going to there because everybody agrees that's the best library. So that is the end of the presentation. So what I've done, I've been giving you a four-step process for approaching how to do genealogy in China. First one is you've got to know something about Chinese characters, but not that much. Second thing, you have to know the name and the place your ancestors are from, and you have to know them in Chinese characters. Third thing is you have to then go out and find your japu. The fourth thing is to actually put it into family search. So Thank you very much for listening, and we hope that we'll have an opportunity to help you in the future. Thank you, Elder West. This has been great. I can hardly wait to get the recording and send it to my grandson, who's headed to Taiwan. Yes, I'd be very interested in knowing how that goes. That'd be fun. I'm going to stop the recording, and then if you have questions, you can put them in the chat, or you can unmute yourself.